Hello everybody, I hope you are doing well in these extraordinary times. Welcome to our new webinar series, Building Up Banks with Mambu. And today we are powered by Creative Construction with Capco and also Solaris Bank. We are joined today by Agnieszka Woloska. Agnieszka, how are you doing today? All good, all good? Hi, very hot, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to this panel. Uh, you're, you're, in, you're in Frankfurt at the moment, is that, is that right? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Also in Germany, joining us from Mambu is uh, Michael Pierce. How are you doing today, Mike? Yeah, doing very good. Thanks. Equally just as hot, um, but also excited <laughs> to be on this panel today. I, it's better than it was. I, I'm currently uh, in the UK where it is uh, the, the, the one, you know, the, the short period of the year where it's not uh, not raining. Yeah. Uh, and also joining us from Solaris Bank, we have Florian Redeker. Florian, how, how are, you, are you also in, uh, in Berlin? I'm in Berlin. I'm in our new office in Kreuzberg, and I actually really enjoy the hot weather. <laughs> Excellent. We are going to be taking uh, questions at the end of this. Uh, we, in fact, actually do celebrate Pride Month around the world. We have a, a prize at the ready for the, uh, for the, best, the best question. Uh, so please, throughout, keep in mind what you want to ask the panel, and then yeah, we'll give a give a little send a little prize in the post for the for the best question. Um, I want to break down in the first instance because today we're going to be talking about embedded finance. Um, so first of all, I want to look to the panel about what embedded finance actually means to to you in your various fields of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of give that that background and also as a part of an introduction into into yourselves, uh, Agnieszka, what sort of where do you view embedded finance within your own uh, your own discipline? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my, my background is in everything what has to do with customers, uh, the, the whole topic of customer experience. And obviously, finance has always been a part of every customer journey. Yeah. Uh, most of the things, uh, unfortunately, we somehow have to pay for, <laughs> and sometimes you can't afford this, so we need a credit or uh, we need whatever financial instrument. And most of the time, until until recently, uh, there was kind of a media break. You know, uh, there was a separation from the experience and the payment or the financial financial service behind this, but. As you started seeing a while ago, and for me, actually the most interesting start or most interesting experience in the area of embedded finance was actually um, Uber. Um, because this was basically the, the first, at least the first time I experienced um, just getting in the car, getting out of the car and the payments just happened by itself, you know? Uh, I mean, we don't have Amazon Go in Germany, so I, I didn't try this, which is a very similar experience with shopping. But you see more and more experiences like this. And um, I think embedded finance is one way to call it. What I would even prefer more is to call it contextual finance, uh, because yep. the finance is basically in the context of the customer or of the user. It's, it's right there where they need it. And this is something I deeply believe uh, is the future of finance. We will see more and more finance uh, embedded in every service. And the interesting thing is what will be the role also of financial institutions, both banks and fintechs uh, in this area. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, Michael, can I ask you kind of from your, from your perspective, your, your... Within, the, the, within your discipline and uh, looking after the partnerships at Mambu, wh yeah. wh where do you see embedded finance within the, uh, well, within the industry? Well, I think there's a couple of ways I'll, I'll answer that to, to break it down, right? Um, Mambu obviously takes a bit more of the technical lens um, and actually does power some of these other, you know, banking as a service embedded finance type propositions across the globe. So we see, um, kind of a number of different propositions and how this is popping up. But I want to actually touch on a bit that Agnieszka just mentioned. And I think we're all maybe probably aligned on this. Uh, embedded finance is not a newer topic, 
right? Embedded finance, at least, is something that has been around for years. If you think about airlines with credit cards, if you think about um, gift cards with, with retail stores, right? What's in this moment where you see the rise of very successful companies like Solaris Bank, for example, and others, is that they are capturing on the new technologies that are becoming available into this industry. They are addressing the change in consumer behaviors, right? Um, just to just to a little bit about this online shopping kind of experience, right? It's it's a no-brainer that COVID has driven this significantly up, right? Um, so what's happened now is you're seeing even more so kind of the convergence of these non-financials that traditionally rely on banks or financial institutions to take care of the financial bit. And have actually I said, we can capture that financial bit ourselves, realize a bit of the prize and embed some of those financial bits into our customer experience and add it as a value added service, just to name a few examples. Yeah, that, that approach to customer experience there, that's absolutely where it, where it embedded all contextual finance, Agnieszka, where that really sits. Um, Florian, let, let, let's go to yourself, because as, as, uh, as mentioned by, uh, by Michael, you guys have been pretty successful within this field. Yeah, I, I think it's going all right. Absolutely. Um, I, I think we, we are kind of um, the, the perfect link between uh, the two statements we just have heard, um, because in the end, Zolaris Bank is um, empowering and enabling um, embedded finance or um, contextual finance. Um, and we do this on the one hand with technology and on the other hand um, with our full banking license, meaning that we make it possible that um, companies, startups, um, fintechs, but established companies and especially established brands as well can um, integrate financial services, uh, services seamlessly into their user experiences. And exactly as Aniska said, um, user experience here, I would say, is key. And um, Solaris Bank um, makes it possible to focus on the user experience. And we, if you want to say so, we strip off all the burdens that come with uh, the underlying rails and um, technical as well as license needs, because this is what we take care of in a way that it is fully compliant and, um, yeah, in the end, integratable with ease into given user experiences. Excellent, excellent. Let's, um, let's talk user experience. Um, I remember when I was at a, a university, went to a, a friend's house and they had, I kid you not, it was a, a coin operated uh, electricity. I, every day you had to put the coins in and that then enabled more electricity to get to the house. That is something you, you don't, again, contextual finance and embedded finance has been around for a while. If you do a credit report on yourself, you'll see all sorts of other utilities on there. Um, equally, that user experience in terms of payments is just absolutely hockey sticked. Every industry, it seems, whether it be from parking to, to space exploration, the user experience itself has just got a lot more seamless. And by seamless, I mean, you don't have to do as much in order to get what you want um, and easy to use and which makes it a lot more accessible to everyone else. Yeah. So against that backdrop, there is that expectation that the experience will be seamless no matter the industry. What impact does this, um, this expectation have on the banking industry in terms of, in terms of setting what the customer will, uh, will expect to see? Um, Agnieszka, can I, can I go to yourself first? I, I, I gather you know, you know, a, a little bit about UX. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. And I mean, when, when you look at the traditional banks, they definitely have a lot of work to do. Um, if you, I don't know if, if you remember the situation from uh, the beginning of the year when one of the major banks um, accidentally transferred uh, not just the interest, but the whole credit back to um, to uh, to the um, like back out of the bank. And sorry, what, what I want to, um, uh, how do you call it in English? <laughs> um, Gläubiger. Gläubiger. Mm. Florian. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ich weiß nicht auch. <lacht> it, it depends. Um, so most likely it's going to be the depth. Depth, depth. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> But double check. It depends on the sentence. Um, so. mm. We'll load up a picture of the news report as well. Was this where someone basically received a ridiculous sum of money in their bank account? Uh, yeah, no, no. That's uh, basically the bank uh, transferred the interest uh, instead of the interest. They transferred the whole debt back to the debtor or back to the money creditor, giver. Huh? Potentially, the creditor. Mm -hmm. or the creditor. Would you, you would call the creditor it? Poten potentially. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Once again. Um, so um, the, the situation that was uh, become known at the beginning of, of the year uh, was that the major bank in, um, by accident transfer a huge sum of money um, to the uh, creditors instead of just transferring um, the interest rate. Um, and this was only possible because of a customer experience that was very, very unintuitive and um, it's it's still in place in, in big financial institutions on like on a lot of you know a lot of levels also when it comes to um to the interaction with the end customer um obviously a lot of things are getting smoother getting better getting more intuitive like a lot of kyc processes that are getting better onboarding processes that are, that are getting better but we live in the age of experience Uh, you know, we expect the experience. Uh, we don't expect to think about it. We definitely don't expect to wait for something. So the <laughs> user now in 2021 wants to have everything now. <laughs> And uh, I think the big tech companies are teaching us this, you know, uh, with yeah. immediate delivery. When you look at Uh, companies that are getting, uh, you know, huge uh, financing rounds yeah. right now with the uh, immediate 10 minutes, eight minutes, seven minutes delivery, you know, yeah. this is driving the trend totally. And uh, as banks, as financial institutions, we need to get there. We need to give the users what they expect. Uh, otherwise, someone else will do. Yeah. I think... Uh I just my, my have a, a couple of thoughts. You, you sparked so many great ideas in my head. I don't want to lose them. Um, I can't stress enough the Amazon Go example because that is such a brilliant example of what we classify as hyper-personalization or customer-centric experiences, right? Um, it, obviously, Mambo is a bit more technology in the back-end aspect, but if we look just from conceptually what Amazon Go has done, essentially, they've looked at the customer journey and identified that the biggest pain point in that customer journey is the checkout process. And if they can eradicate that checkout process entirely, they could likely increase conversion rates and have more spending, which ultimately re results in more revenues. So I think, you know, we've seen a few reports on our side and also from our, some of our customers where... Um, you know, I think there was a Gartner study that came out that, that shows that some companies investing in personalization are outselling their counterparts by up to 30% or more, right? Deloitte found, I think, that 80% of their consumers are more likely to purchase that companies um, with personalized experiences, essentially. And so what we've seen from our, you know, 200 plus customers across the world has been that the product has kind of taken a bit of a backseat and that experience has become the forward seat. I, as a consumer, don't want to care about the product behind my buy now, pay later proposition. Um, you know, I want to just know that I can buy now and pay later and then everything else will kind of sort itself out. And, and, and to kind of round that off in terms of, you know, what opportunity this means for, for the financial industry or for banks in general, if they adopt these principles, um, essentially is using this whole customer-centric approach. To do so, you need to have access to data and embrace the rise of openness of data and PST2 and all of these different elements um, together. And when you allow yourself as an organization, and I know Florian, you probably can speak better to this than I can, um, but when you allow yourselves to do data-driven insights in terms of even just lending, for example, You can reduce your, you know, reduction. Uh, you, you know, you can reduce your um, non-performing loan uh, rates. Essentially, you can have a 15% reduction in collection costs. You can actually increase margins and service SME markets, and you know, 
even so, and I think this is probably a good segue to you, Florian, um, mm -hmm. you can actually tap, tap into kind of these cash rich non-financials and work with them essentially. So, so maybe, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to, to mention, some thoughts. Absolutely, I, I fully agree here. And um, the whole story around embedded finance is, is way bigger than just the payment part, right? Um, so you have to think about this holistically and you will see that with, um, banking as a service um we at least this is what what solaris bank is in the market for we democratize um the integration of financial services into existing products and thereby we break down the market entry barriers if you want to say so um for existing brands for existing experiences into the financial sector and I think this is the powerful shift here, because before the incumbent banks have been able to get away with subpar user experience because they had a monopoly, if you want to say so, on, on their processes, because it was the, the market entry um, barriers have been so high that, that this was possible. Um, they they caught, could keep their existing um, user experiences because they had this um, yeah, walled garden and they, they had it very comfortable in there. And maybe now those times are over because um, with technology, with a new view um, onto finance, it is out of a sudden possible to create those seamless user experience and integrate those financial services deeply into existing um, things and things in the sense of there, there can be a multitude of use cases. Mm -hmm. And this is what people care about. I'm, I'm deeply convinced about that because nobody wants to get a credit for a house, a car. Um, people want to get this problem solved within yeah. the user experience they are already in. The credit is just a vehicle to make it happen. Nobody wants to, to care about payments. Um, people transfer money to get things done. The money transfer itself is, is not a joyful experience. I mean, like maybe for us as bankers, um, but usually the end customer is, is not amazed because a transfer reaches the other end super fast. Um, sometimes they are, but usually this is not the, the main thing they care about. They want to get the job done. And I think um, with, with banking as a service, with embedded finance, um, we make banking a commodity, if you want to say so. It sounds, being the one in the industry, that might sound a bit unattractive, but I think for the user, this is the very powerful thing um, because the lending, the payment, all this steps into the background. It just works seamlessly. And this works for Amazon Go, um, or within Uber, but this is true for many other use cases as well. So we leverage, for example, Manbu on our lending side to organize our um, credit ledgers, um, and this is deeply integrated into our tech stack um, beside other core banking technology. And then we, we put our APIs on top together with, with the license to enable our partners to create those seamless experiences within the products. They are already there. And thereby, I would say, we as, as Solaris Bank do our best to, to move the financial burdens rather to the background and make them yeah, seamless. And also the moving the technology to the background, because this is actually also uh, fascinating. You have like these two levels, the finance and the technology. And the only thing that the customer is seeing at the end is magic. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it's like paradoxically, the yeah. technology is making the experience actually more human, you know, yeah. because there is a ton of technology behind and without technology, all the things will not be possible. But as a user, I don't see this and I don't have to understand this. Uh, yeah. I don't have to take care of this. Uh, it is just happening for me. And this is... Uh, I think like really amazing uh, thing that's possible right now. 
I, I always, um, whenever doing any of these, I'm always thinking if I was in an audience right now and this was on stage, what would I be tweeting? Um, Florian, that line of uh, embedded finance makes banking a commodity. I mean, that's a very, very good kind of way of, of putting it. Um, now, I, I don't know if you've, if you've heard this quote before, um, but Bill Gates once said, um, again, if, 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 you've, if you've ever heard this before, do let me know. But he, he said, we need banking, but we don't, we don't need banks anymore. Probably a pretty, you know, pretty underused quote. But I always find that fascinating because you look back at the history of finance. You've got uh, AP Giannini with uh, Bank of Italy, and that moved banking from being a few centralized locations to a branch network that instantly brought millions of people financial services. It brought that to, to, to the masses. And then, of course, the smartphone brought those millions, went from millions to having billions of people access to it. And now within each of these smartphones, there are a huge number of, of different apps and applications. And that brings it, well, the, the, the opportunity is there to bring not just finance to everyone, but also the right kind of products to, to every, every individual. Um, and by right, I mean what, what they want as them, as what as we've talked about before, uh, personalization. So uh, yeah, ba ba banking services are, are pretty much everywhere and the opportunity is everywhere for them to be. Um, every touch point in any industry has the chance for embedded finance. So to, to throw this open to all of you and building on what we've talked about in terms of that, that user experience, um, I, I need to visit an Amazon Go store, I really do. How, um, how can banks capitalize on this opportunity? Because you don't want to be left to the side and there is a massive opportunity for finance firms to really take advantage of the, the technology is, as Agnieszka said, the technology is here now to use embedded finance. Mm -hmm. um, Agnieszka, did you want to take that first? What, what, what should banks be doing in this space? I mean, they, they, they are already seeing this trend. A lot of banks are also talking about uh, embedded finance and actually doing things in this area. And I mean, the topics we touched upon until now were mostly in like end customer area, but that's not the only part. I mean, there are also great opportunities in the uh, business to business um, area. Uh, you know, when it comes to topics like trade finance, there are great opportunities for embedded finance, for example, or also um, quite, quite recently, uh, Commerzbank uh, enabled um, handling of uh, transaction between transactions between Evonik and BASF uh, via digital money. Uh, so basically, uh, it makes also possible uh, transactions between these uh, two companies much more uh, seamless and without a lot of manual work. So when we speak of customer experience and when we speak of uh, embedded finance. This is not just, you know, uh, the stuff we see as users, but it's also like the, all the business to business uh, efficiency part, actually. And this is obviously also one thing, one thing I see with, uh, with banks as they have the connections, they are serving this kind of customers. Um, so this is definitely an option for them. And on the other hand, obviously for all the companies who are not in the financial service industry, but have all these touch points in the journey, this is also something to think of and maybe cooperate with, with their bank on, um, on this kind of topics. But also on the other hand, obviously uh, all the topics we are already uh, talking about, uh, you see basically every week or probably every day um, news from companies like Stripe, uh, for example, you know, um, uh, now they started a new product uh, in the uh, field of KYC. Um, so this is obviously yeah. also something a bank could do. Yeah? I mean, uh, they are a little bit behind right now with this kind of, uh, with, with this kind of companies. On the other hand, you see, <laughs> then again, a bank like Goldman are cooperating, for example, with Apple, you know. Uh, so, so there are a lot of opportunities for banks. It's like not that the, the battle is lost or won now. So everyone, so everyone has an opportunity in this field and this makes it so interesting. I think so too. And I, I don't know if it's all right uh, to disagree with Bill Gates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I think it's fine. I think, it's fine. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> he, will, he, will, he will probably enjoy it. Um, 
I, I think there's still a, a good reason um, that banks are out there. Um, I, at least me personally, I don't want want to live in a in a world where banks do not exist anymore. And I do not say this as a banker, but as as an actual citizen of a of a society, because there is a fair reason that banks are out there, that they are regulated by the state, and that there is supervision and control to make sure that the financial ecosystem is controlled and works um, for the people and not against the people. And I, I think this is this is a notion which is sometimes a bit lost um, when we discuss about cryptocurrencies and um, getting rid of the banking system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I fully agree with Gates um, when, when he thinks about the, the user experience. Sometimes banks there stand in the way um, of what people want to achieve. And this is changing now. And, and this is one of my main motivators personally to, to work in this industry and drive banking as a service forward. But on the other hand, it's great that um, society has an eye on those systems um, and makes sure that, that those systems work for the people and not against them. Yeah. And from that point of view, I think it's, it's a good thing that banks are still around. May yeah. I add just a short, short thing to this? Because it remembers me on uh, uh, also on, uh, on an interesting uh, questionnaire, interesting statistics. Uh, because we always discuss, discuss, especially after the financial crisis, that uh, the banks are not very trust for, uh, trustworthy yeah. and, uh, you know, they have quite a bad image. But actually, people still trust banks more uh, than they, for example, trust big techs or fintechs. <laughs> so they still have a, a specific positioning and that people generally trust them in, in, in some sense. Michael, can I get you to weigh in here? Because I, I imagine some of the organizations that you work with are, are, are really looking at how best to, well, best to capitalize on the embedded finance era. I think, yeah, I think it's a couple of things. You know, we, I always like to say um, but the reason for this eroded trust maybe is obviously a result of some practices of the banking institutions previously, right? So this in itself has driven the need for a new kind of consumer experience, if you will. Um, banks historically have made customers work on their behalf. And I think what you're seeing now is customers are demanding that works, uh, excuse me, that banks work on their behalf, right? And that paradigm shift is what's changing this, right? Um, from, from my perspective, right, there's, I think banks just have to really adapt and adopt five really kind of major trends, right? They need to, they need to really understand the consumer behaviors are changing. They need to understand specifically what that actually means in their business. So um, not just lowering interest rates or eroding fees in bank accounts, but actually um, partnering with brands to be able to launch better services. I mean, just to mention Solaris again, uh, how many brands are you currently working with? And these brands themselves are recognized if you look at you know, some of the ones that you have. And, and, and behind all these brands is, is one bank, right? It is all Solaris. And, and, and how many of people I know, even in Berlin and Germany that use these other brands and as soon as I reference, oh, that's actually a Solaris, you know, bank brand that's working together. Um, it's kind of a, wow, that's, that's actually banking. I didn't realize, or this is something in that case. And so that, that kind of way of thinking is what's happening. I think the second is um, really banks need to start to embrace banking disruptors. I think it's always been this little fintech versus bank friction that's existed, or will they become a big thing? Will they not become a big thing? Um, is the, you know, the threat of tech giants entering into the space real or is it not real? I think the convergence of being able to provide services and find a harmony within this is something that's going to be very critical. Um, banking as a service, that's my third point, kind of goes without being said, that's also a pretty critical piece. I can't stress again, my fourth point, the rise of openness and being able to actually better use data-driven insights and ultimately the last point, which I think is probably the most critical bit, is don't overlook certain customer segments because they're just deemed to be too expensive or profit unprofitable. 
find ways to optimize your architecture, your technology, your experience to be able to serve this market. Otherwise, there will be others that enter. One of our other customers, New10, which is a spin-off of ABN Ambro, uh, captured this model back in 2016, quite early in the stage of this adoption, right? They identified that the SME market is traditionally high risk, at not a lot of reward and just not marginally appealing, if you will. And so how did they tackle it? They broke it down from organizational, right? How do we have to reorganize ourselves? Maybe we have to create a specifically brand new brand and even a whole new team separate from the actual you know, incumbent aspect. The second is like, how do we embrace the rise of new technologies and work with SaaS solutions, cloud-based, uh, more cloud-native solutions, API-first initiatives, you know, these things. And then the third is you know, understand that banking is not finite, it is infinite, which means it is continually evolving and we'll need to keep adapting. And can we build an organizational and team and practices around adapting to this rapidly changing environment? So I think more organizationally is kind of another bit. And maybe just one 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 thing. Uh, so so what what you were speaking about is basically showing how banking or finance has become general ecosystem, and there are like a lot of players from financial service, but also some from non financial service. When you look at automotive, when you look at telco, uh, so many interactions with finance. When you look at retail. And, and the question is who will play which role in this ecosystem, yeah? And, yeah. and even probably switching roles depending on the specific need. Uh, and this is actually quite, quite, quite an interesting uh, field we are now because the roles in the ecosystem are not fixed yet. They are, they are still like fluid and evaluating. Yeah, very true. Yeah. New10 is a, is a kind of a, a perfect example. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of the work they do. Um, but unfortunately, they've they've made it look um, they've made it look really easy, and so you then have the likes of well, Bo and RBS is kind of the the textbook one of trying to kind of build that speedboat bank that didn't quite get gain the same level of traction that perhaps it might have done. I don't want to go kind of too deep into fintechs versus big banks, but in terms of embedded finance, do you think that they're trying to repeat the same? business model as opposed to try and actually try something new with with where finance can be embedded maybe repeat the same question just so i can understand the context of that so do, do you think banks are basically trying to go all oh, right so we're gonna we're gonna try and build they, they, they want finance we're gonna try and build a new bank uh and oh banks need to have this banks need to have this banks need to have this as opposed to an example where i for example amazon go goes back to looking at the customer first and goes they just want to walk in and walk out We'll have the we'll have the payment method where the finance is at, uh, ha happening automatically as people leave. Do you think banks need to get out that mindset of trying to rebuild what, what's already come before? I think banks it very much depends on the geography. I think if I'm okay. being specific, right? I think it's very unique to where um, you have to look at it from a couple of different lenses, right? Europe, Germany, um, other markets in in this area have adopted some of the from a regulatory perspective, I should say, the ability to do things like this, right? So cloud even in itself was a struggle in some countries still, for example. So I think from one thing, when, when banks try to change and adapt overall and try and even introduce this in just in the context of embedded finance, you have to look at it through, in my geography, from a regulatory perspective, how can I do this? And what's, what's the risk of doing so, right? And that kind of then will then enable you to understand which type of service or product should I do. I don't think it's necessarily, um, do we try to repeat a number 26 uh, or should we buy the number 26 discussion, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I think that that's kind of out the window. That's in the past, right? I think now players have placed their stakes in the ground, right? And now to Agnes's point earlier, it's about how these players play with each other and where in the market they're all kind of working with each other. Um, just, you know, do we, does one company want to offer a buy now, pay later proposition specifically, although they have a license to offer all different propositions or should we hyper-focus on just one geography and offer all financial services in this one ge geography, right? This kind of, this, this, this consulting brain in my mind kind of creates a little bit of a matrix, which I wish I could just project onto the screen of almost like regulatory versus time versus cost versus profitability. You know, these, these metrics are things that institutions need to take to, to be able to make those decisions and how they want to play. But I don't think it's a, 
rebuild versus you know approach if you will excellent well let's um let, let's look at some of the kind of the, the the use cases not just from a geographical perspective but from a vertical perspective too because well everyone is getting into banking it seems um ikea easyjet and air asia have both announced work that they're doing within the within the payments markets and, and and i think um sorry and i think they're um they're the the framework basically michael michael just described becomes a bit more too complex for just a powerpoint slide so it's it wouldn't be a, a four field matrix um but but way more because I think we touched both aspects um, already before in the conversation. It's about brand, and this links to to all the things uh, you have mentioned. Do people trust, for a certain use case, their bank or IKEA? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say it depends on on what what they want to achieve, and in many cases, maybe IKEA would be the the brand that gets more trust for this specific embedded finance service. Um, and I think banks in the past 10, 15, 20 years jeopardized their brands to quite some extent. And now just coming along and say like, well, let's do a rebranding. We just uh, find a fancy new young brands and everything is going to be fine. It's not that easy because with embedded finance, uh, finance, the market entry barriers drop significantly. So out of a sudden, they do not compete with other banking brands, like, of course, N26, as an example, is still a very, very strong competitor in the typical banking sector. But the, the embedded finance competition works on completely different means. And therefore, just spitting up another banking brand will give them market share against N26. Yeah. But that is not the game the others play. The other, the other player embedded finance game and just spinning up another banking brand will in the end lead to a situation where they just compete in, in the same game while the others play a different game. Yeah. Um, and that, that's gonna, gonna lead to, let's say, um, interesting uh, dynamics. Yeah. Can I just start, ask a sort of follow-up thing there around, I, I, again, IKEA, trusted brand, um, do you think the fact that IKEA, as soon as it starts doing a lot of stuff and more and more things within, say, consumer banking services, do you think by nature of the fact it's doing work within that industry, its trust is actually going to decrease just by nature of the fact it's in the industry? Or do you think it will, well, depending how it's delivered, it would arguably go up? Do you think it's, it's down to the brand or the actual, the nature of the beast, so to speak? I think this is, I mean, the brand is always trusted in a particular context, you know? And I trust IKEA with my furniture, and then I trust IKEA. Uh, I mean, I might trust. I mean, that's. I was going to say, I'm not sure. If them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I perfectly trust. I trust that's... IKEA. Um, I trust IKEA with giving me an uh, interesting thing to do when I, uh, you know, when I put together <laughs> all this stuff. Um, I don't know. I might I might trust uh, Adidas with a particular thing, but then I don't trust them with another thing you know uh, so uh, it's, it's always what I associate with them and um, and also it's I, for me it's still all around the need and all around like the media break you know when I um, when I have to go someone else somewhere else to get what I actually need I'm out, you know, when I, when I buy something and then I have to go to the bank to get the credit, I might, might reconsider. Every time I switch, I get out of, of the journey. That's a potentially a conversion killer, you know? And, um, and that's why, what I, why, why I stress this, this ecosystem option, you know? Uh, one thing is, so who is providing these journeys, you know? Who, 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 is, uh, who has the customers, you know? Who is serving the needs? And, and I think that um, banks, for example, can learn from, from these non-financial brands, you know, because, because they come from a different perspective. They understand more about other customer needs, for yeah. example. They understand the customer journeys. And, and, and then it's not the, the, maybe the question, do I trust IKEA or do I trust 
Deutsche Bank, you know, it's it's the question. Okay, I have the I have the IKEA. Okay, they will not work with Deutsche Bank because they have their own bank. But hypothetically, uh, I I trust IKEA with my shopping experience. But then I see, okay, they are servicing the uh, the, the the credit uh, line, for example, that I can get directly or. Um, there is an insurance company embedded that is providing the insurance for all the goods, and yeah. and then I probably trust uh, trust the, the the ecosystem, you know, and um, that's yeah. that's I think something something we have to find out. It's it's not really to say like, do I trust them more or do I trust them more? It's uh, um, it's it's a, it's this ecosystem play. Yeah. I think I, I'd love to just highlight an example of where a brand has actually pivoted into uh, banking and where that's actually something I've seen successful and, and honestly something where I was surprised when I first came across it. And it's happening more and more now frequently. Look at Orange Telco. Uh, that is a brilliant example of when they approached us in, I think it was to 2018, we can fact check that, and uh, to, to, to essentially launch a, a bank. Or, or, or essentially work with us to launch a bank in Spain. Um, I remember seeing this coming in and thinking, what is a telco? It's in banking, it's, it's, it's phones. What, what, what does this make sense? But then you realize that Orange as a company has such a strong brand in a number of different organizations and countries. It is trusted, it is proven, mm -hmm. and they have pivoted into essentially the financial space because they, they, they've been able to also encapsulate on the big data that they use to have better insights, to understand the types of financial products that their consumers are going to need, um, how they can better tailor lending and products, deposit products, insurance, even all these other things that they're working on. And that, that particular segment, it, it might not be that Starbucks, for example, I would put my money <laughs> with Starbucks in, in a bank account if Starbucks launched a bank, although I nowadays don't know if I owe anything of who wants to launch into banking. Uh, but I think that a telephone provider or, 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 or someone of that sort, it also comes down to that category and, and, and their credibility in that market. Oh, Orange Bank is a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, Florian, <laughs> did, did you want to weigh in on this? Uh, yeah. So I imagine you've got some great some great examples here. And I, I think that too, it's, it's a beautiful example, um, which shows as well how the perception of trust changed in the last, well, let's say since the iPhone, so basically 15 years potentially, that people trust user experience and technology, if it's well done, way more than John Doe in the rural Sparkasse, which calls himself a, a banking consultant who, who decides in my favor, but in the end he doesn't decide in my favor, but in his Sparkasse's um, favor. This trust is lost, I would say, while at the same time people started to, to trust their devices because they have their phone in their hand every day. When the experience is well done, this seems or is so seamless that um, that they just move on. They just do this because with a good ex user experience, it adds up to the brand and brands are trust. And in the end, what you need for banking is trust. And for, for that reason, I, I fully agree with Agnieszka that um, it depends on the context. But in the right context, people tend to trust um, certain brands way more than, than a random banking brand, which just offers basically the whole vertical in a non-seamless user experience. Maybe I can just also add the, an example, which was also recently quite interesting. We can definitely discuss if this brand is trustworthy. Um, but uh, the, the example you showed with, you know, with orange and banking uh, and also what, what you, Florian, said, we trust certain devices, things that we use. And one of the devices, a different one we use is a car. Um, uh, and <laughs> a certain uh, American uh, car company uh, that is led by a very crazy person um, also recently actually um, they got into the flamethrowers, the, didn't they? Sorry? They got into flamethrowers, didn't they? They, they, they <laughs> sometimes go in flames, but, uh, and you know, they, they buy Bitcoins and then they don't buy Bitcoins, you know? <laughs> 
Um, but what they recently did, uh, now it's obvious that we are speaking about Tesla, um, they actually registered an insurance in Germany as well, you know, and uh, this is also pretty logical. So when we speak of financial services, not just banking, it's obviously also insurance. And yeah, I mean, why should I go somewhere else to insure my car? Why don't I have a, as a part of a service within uh, my, my car, you know, and I think the the whole insurance topic will really also get get quite interesting, especially you know in Germany uh, we really love insurance, you know uh, we are insured we have like tons of insurance like for everything insurance <laughs> for insurance yeah insurance for insurance actually as I, as I came to Germany I really I have really no idea that I need so 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 much so much insurance, um, but uh, but yeah having this actually also embedded in the devices in the car embedded in the whole process of you know, buying something or having an experience that I actually want to ensure it's also quite an interesting aspect. And uh, I, I, I mean, we are already seeing quite a lot this in this space as well. The last thing I kind of want to, want to touch on uh, for um, on this and actually rounds out neatly with, it is a cliche, but my God, as a good example is, is Uber. Um, Uber has affected the taxi industry so much that now if I take a, a black cab in London, I get out and I think and, and then I, I'm trained now by Uber to just get out of the car and not pay, as opposed <laughs> to the I, I don't have to manually sort of go back and do the friction if I'm using a black cab. That that kind of training is rife across the across consumers now. You can see a similar thing happening when Amazon Go becomes more and more prolific, that the smaller shops that don't have that kind of experience, people will just walk out thinking, oh yeah, of course it will automatically take it. <laughs> With with that in mind, against the the changing and future uh, consumer expectations, w what is the future of embedded finance, and w why should companies care and, and keep investing within this uh, within this remit? Uh, do you go first, very, Agnieszka? I think it's very easy to get used to a good experience. I just really had this yesterday. You know, I was working my iPad, and then I switched to my computer. And I, I wanted to scroll with my finger from, <laughs> uh, through the screen because it's just, it comes so naturally, you know? And I think this is the same uh, with, with all the financial service uh, uh, topics, you know? Uh, when, when you see like, um, uh, for example, the Uber experience or even, or, or what you said is the Amazon, um, uh, the Amazon cashier uh, cash shops that you just go out and um, I believe that it will go pretty much in this direction. It's going to be even more personalized, even more, more automated. Um, and um, there are obviously also things that are somehow concerning. Um, so I believe one of the aspects within embedded finance in the future um, can become the topic of financial health um, because, you know, not uh thinking about the fact that we have to pay makes us also spend more uh and uh, makes us maybe spend the money not in a way that's uh more most sustainable for us uh so i believe that financial health will be become an aspect and uh, this will be probably also something that's embedded there is already also in, like a new bank uh, still pretty small that's uh, basically working with a chat interface where I can just write, can I, can I afford this? You know, I want to buy this and this, how, how can I afford this? And uh, um, I'm really looking forward to this kind of aspect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I really believe in the, 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 the ecosystem topic. And I, I have no idea right now who, who will win the race. Maybe there will be totally unexpected uh, winners you know we we, we, uh, we 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 have no idea or they maybe don't don't even exist yet um but there is still so much to do uh that yeah i mean i'm, I'm very poor with my you know glass um uh, sphere i don't know how, how do you say it uh, crystal ball. Uh, or crystal ball, crystal yeah. ball. <laughs> with my with my crystal ball um because there is like so many you know so many movement in so many directions but I'm, I'm really pretty sure that it's going to be more intuitive, it's going to be more automated, more personalized, and, um, and the overall experience will be better, both in a, a B2C and a B2B context. 
Yeah. I was hoping you'd do a real cheesy kind of point at the camera and be like, the women are <laughs> you, the consumer. <laughs> uh, Michael. Yeah, no, I think, Agnieszka, um, you covered everything. I actually was crossing off my list of things I wanted to mention as you were speaking. Uh, but, but I think I, I, I want to stress uh, one critical thing, right? I think um, building off of the financial fitness or financial health, um, this, this is, in my personal opinion, um, not representative of anything. This is exactly the, the next wave of where embedded finance can shift into. Uh, if you look at companies like PFC in the Nordics, which are a digital you know, money app, they're not even branding themselves specifically, I think, as a bank. They're, they're, they're a money app that kind of has all different types of services, goals planning and, and budgeting that's embedded in this one app there. I think that's one case. You know, some of the big banks have even started to adopt it with a financial fitness score from HSBC. They've launched something where you can fill out a questionnaire and show how fit <laughs> you are financially. Um, so I think that element is going to be critical. Where that transpires, though, throughout embedded finance, if we make it relatable to a specific product, and I think it is better data-driven insights around scoring and decisioning around lending, right? I think we're about to enter into an economy as a result of quite a hopefully once in a lifetime experience of a pandemic, although I'm not sure if this is the last one. And um, we will, you know, we're about to enter into post pandemic economy, right? So how do we still ensure that credits and lending can, can be available to those that were significantly impacted by this, this experience, right? And potentially have had eroded credit scores as a result of furlough or um, being laid off, or um, I forget what it's called in German, uh, small short time uh, Kurzarbeit, uh, the, you know these things here and um, so you need to be able to embrace the adoption of big data and actually if you look at a company in the UK called Bud for example they're actually using rent rental repayments or rent payments accuracy of that as a way to provide an API for banks to start using and to score and decide based on that element of data coupled with connecting to Gmail, where there's other companies I've seen out there in the past that are seeing your response rate on emails and all of this together kind of helps I, them understand you, which ultimately means you become more credit worthy in their perspective. And by them, I mean the financial institution. And, and that ultimately just is a win-win overall. I think that's the future of where we're seeing the shift. Very, uh, very well said there, especially around credit scores, because that's uh, that, that could be a whole other topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Florian, can I get your 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 viewpoint? I mean, you may already know, but you know, can I keep it close to your chest? But where do you see the the, the future of, of embedded finance? Well, I think we we touched on on basically all details um, within the last hour, and from my point of view, I would summarize it in a way by by saying that classical banking at the moment is very often still a burden and far away from being fair or easy or frictionless, and it shouldn't be like that. And from that point of view, to some extent, I think we're gonna see a fall of classical banking and a rise of embedded findings by making banking a commodity underneath so that seamless user experience can stand on top of, on top of it to make banking easy, seamless, and joyful. And um, there is still a lot to do. Um, many, many banking experiences are far, far away from this. So really look forward to those easy experiences and all the innovation that, that will come with it and enable it. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a, a one minute break now, uh, and then we're gonna have some questions from the, uh, from the audience. That's incredible. Look at these. Michael, Florian, you guys have, uh, that's the fastest haircut I have ever seen in my life. We're living in an agile economy. We have to keep up with the rapid pace. So that transpires also to haircuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not only not... The, the seven minutes grocery delivery, but like the seven minutes uh, haircut delivery. Yeah. <laughs> that is the next exactly. level, yes. It's, it's by gorillas, I guess you could say. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Be beauty is a service. Um, 
Right, we've actually got a couple of questions. Um, I've got one that I want to bring up first of all, um, because I think it's a great one. Uh, this is, I'm going to, I'm really sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your name, but I'm going to go for it with confidence. Taran Kishnani uh, from, and I believe you're from ICICI. Um, he says, are banks in competition with everyone in tech? And what is made given that we now do banking with a lot of people without actually meeting the customer since we have so much data on customers with their digital history? Um, an example I always bring up for this, I personally use Gmail. I have never spoken to anyone from Gmail. I've never had to contact their customer services or any kind of customer support because the product is completely on the money. Um, equally, I know we talk about Amazon a lot as an example, but um, I've never had to really contact Amazon because they focus so heavily on the product that there's no need for that. Same with uh, same with Square. Um, so how, 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 without with so much data, how are banks in competition with tech and where does embedded finance play into this? I think we can already see the competition, uh, you know, by uh, both Google and Apple uh, and Amazon and basically every, pretty much everyone getting into the sphere of financial services. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we, we kind of observe the frenem frenemy approach, you know, uh, we see Deutsche Bank cooperating with Google on certain aspects, you know, and uh, you see, I mean, the corporate, the, the Google card, um, the Apple card, sorry, is in cooperation with uh, Goldman. So there is cooperation. And for me, as I said before, there is the ecosystem question and who will play which role in the ecosystem. Uh, which doesn't mean that the banks should say, oh, that's fine. I mean, we're in a good place and uh, there will be place for everyone in the ecosystem. Uh, don't, don't misinterpret me, uh, me in this way. I think what the, what the Googles and, and other ta big techs are doing very well is kind of being in the point of need of the customer. Um, that's the one side. On the other hand, when you see the trust level when it comes especially to financial services, um, they are they are not that trusted uh, as the banks are in the moment. So uh, we even after, you know even though uh, the, the the trust uh, of of banks uh, or of people in banks uh, kind of depreciated, but still they are still still trusted when it comes to data, for example, especially after recent scandals with with the big techs and uh, in the context of data. So um, yeah, I mean we are they are in competition, but um, the race is still on. Yeah, I think from, from my point of view, um, we uh, sorry, sorry, Michael. Um, I, from my point of view, I think we we have to to twist the question maybe a little bit because from my point of view, um, all companies are in competition for the best best user experience. Yeah. And then the question is, what is the best user experience? Um, of course, you could could spin up a Gmail service with a personal um, assistant. But this would be more expensive and potentially more cumbersome. I love that I do not have to call anybody to log into my Gmail account. Um, and that might be true for many, many other uh, user experiences around uh, personal finance. Um, so I think that is, that is the competition vector uh, we have to talk about. And very often, um, somebody, um, well, a person is not needed anymore due to tech. So tech is the enabler um, for yeah. different user experiences from my point of view. Agreed. And just to add one more point to that, I think it's also the access that these big techs, and, and also I'd include telcos in that mix as well, the amount of data that they have already accessible to them to make better data-driven insights and have customer-centric approaches when it comes to products, along with brand recognition, does give maybe perception-wise a bit more of an advantage from their perspective. But to, to Agnes's point earlier, the trust element behind the banking level has not yet quite reached where a new traditional bank might already have with their consumers. So just some thoughts to add. Absolutely. Maybe just one, one, one thing, sorry, on the personal side, on the, on the, on the side that the, uh, the big techs didn't meet their customers. I mean, in our generation, uh, I mean, 
millennials would prefer to go to dentists than to go to a bank branch. And I, I feel it myself, you know, when, when there's like a, some bank advisor trying to call me, I'm like, uh, you know, my pulse is getting up and, and I just like, you know, don't call me, just, just, you know, just give me the access to self-service and to do it like remotely, but please don't call me. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I do want to point out, and I won't go too far into it, but one of the few companies to take on Amazon and um, for want of a better word, win uh, was uh, well, Square uh, and, and a FinTech. And that's because they, they utilize their innovation stack and how they dealt with customers so efficiently. Um, following this on around, around big tech, I've got another question from Ty Lee, um, which is about unbundling. Um, the big tech, the big guys, they are unbundling banking services. Um, what can the very large banks do to cope with this this unbundling trend? I'm sure a lot of people. If you've cracked this, please, you know. Uh, I think. Mike, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say. I think it it comes from analyzing specifically the product lines in which they need to unbundle from the banking. Right. It, it kind of ties into that customer centric approach in terms of what customers are actually demanding within the markets these banks are operating. And I think it's starting to, um, one, look at organizational change in terms of how the organization itself needs to change to be able to stay competitive with this unbundling that's existing. And then two, embracing, as I come from more of the technical world, if you will, in this, in this space, um, adopting new technologies, adopting new ways of working, implementing products and services, adopting cloud, agile principles, these solutions to be able to meet these kind of expectations and work within data-driven insights, hyper-personalization and, and, and those kind of elements there. Maybe I'll, Florian, from your perspective, um, maybe you have some thoughts around how the Solaris bit is, is, is tackling from the actual bank side. Um, well, customer centricity, I think is the, is the major starting point. And then um, thinking about the user experience again, thinking where ex established banks can offer um, added value um, that might not be that, that easy, easily covered by digital user experiences. Because I think for now, um, big banks have to accept that in digital uh, digital user experiences are better built by big tech at the moment. Um, so we need to leverage um, brand and personal connection um, to to cope with that. I would say. But the unbundling, you know, you see this in in banking, but you see it like in everywhere that you have like basically current constant fluctuations between unbundling and rebundling, you know, because you started like, for example, the fintech started with a, a very specific uh, yeah. Uh, products and basically, as 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 you said, uh, unbundling the services, and then you see they are starting adding yeah. other things uh, and maybe bundling with another experience, and and that's what you have seen in apps, you know, besides just financial services, kind of uh, unbundle, then rebundle, then unbundle again, then rebundle again. <laughs> And, and of course, I think it's fair to admit that um, banks need to leapfrog on the technology end. So it yeah. feels like that somewhere in the 80s, big banks agreed on a non-attack um, contract that technology is nothing they're going to compete with. Um, and this changed tremendously in the last five years, 10 years. Um, and, and now this is something that needs to be leapfrogged. And I think Solaris Bank, as well as Mambu, we are enablers um, for, for this um, big step forward on the technology end um, to be, be able to compete again um, yeah. with, with technology giants. Excellent. There you go. There you go, Ty. Um, I've got another one I want to bring up. And I'm dreading bringing it up. I know this could be a very, very long discussion. This is from uh, Frida Rica. Um, do you see any risks arising with embedded finance for the consumer? Um, and how can companies ensure financial well-being of their consumers in this instance? This is obviously yeah. consumers effectively almost becoming a bit of a product. Um, yeah. Agnieszka, I can see you nodding away there. Do, do, you want, do you want to go with that one? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, as we all are... Um also touched the aspect of um, of financial well-being 
being being an opportunity but also being a risk this is this is a very important question that's not easy to answer uh with with uh, just a few words um so I, I see two possibilities in going into two different direction. I, I see an opportunity of actually guaranteeing more uh, financial well-being because of um, having the whole information about the customer data, about the customer situation, about their spendings and needs. And uh, I, I really hope that we will move um, in, into this direction. Um, and um, obviously, there is all when it comes to basically all experience, but especially an experience that has to do with either finance or sensitive data or both. Uh, obviously, all the companies need to have some checks and balances when it comes to ethical use of the data and ethical use of the financial information. Uh, in Germany, the topics are also fairly regulated. Uh, so um, I think we're kind of, uh, I, I see a lower risk here of, of this uh, going totally sideways. Um, it's, it's less regulated in different areas when it's more about the companies kind of, kind of sticking to ethical standards. Uh, but yeah, I think this is a question that will um, keep us busy for the, for the years to come. Michael. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I was going to say, I think, you know, you, you look at the rise of point of sale lending, buy now, pay later propositions, right? These are fantastic solutions that are addressing very specific customer needs as a part of a customer journey within embedded finance context. Um, so on one hand, that's, that's a tremendous outcome, right? On the other hand, you have to be careful and look at and make sure that the customer is aware of what is going on. Sometimes as consumers, our own um, behaviors can be our own demise, if you will. And, and if we're not made aware of what's actually, you know, if you're buying a purchase and it's actually being financed and what that interest rate is and, and those kinds of elements, there could be a little bit of a risk in terms of how many outstanding credits do I actually have as a consumer? Where are my credits and how is my credit score being um, impacted? So that, that brings to the point where having the rise of, you know, democratizing data essentially and making actual data becoming more accessible so that it can be shared freely amongst different institutions and centralized so that better data-driven insights and the consumer has better visibility into their holistic kind of point of view without having a bottleneck of a banker calling you and then telling you you have to do this or that. So I think it's, it's a risk, but there's also an area of opportunity to address that risk because of some of the trends as well. Absolutely. I mean, the opportunity there is huge, especially when you've got um, I was speaking with a, a company called Bloom, which is more about trying to become the Google Translate of data. Um, so from people coming from, say, for example, Syria, um, with an incredibly huge uh, data, which is no longer accepted anywhere, is how to almost translate that. Um, but as you said, it is about democratizing that data. Uh, 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 Florian. Uh, yes, well, I, I would say I, I fully agree with the round, um, absolutely. Um, and well, maybe we're going to see waves um, in the sense um, that that the market will adapt to the different uh, knowledge of the customer. At the moment, I think it's fair to say that the um, overall landscape is a bit overwhelming to end customers. Um, and, and maybe we're going to see um, more and more offers that come together. Um, and that makes the, the overall landscape, the, the product landscape and offering landscape a bit easier to digest for the end customer. Um, but, but this is going to be a, a market development um, that, that is still in the making, I would say. Yeah, ni nice, easy, easy question there, Frida. Um, I've got time for one more question. I want to go for, and again, apologies for mispronouncing, for uh, Vishwas Masur. Um, I quite like this one. Banks obviously provide a lot of services, uh, sorry, banks provide a lot of services through platforms like Android, like AWS. Um, if the likes of Google, Apple and Microsoft literally entered banking in a almost homogenous product kind of way, is there um, a conflict of interest? And is, is that a problem? Because I know, for example, Ada, uh, Amazon competes with Netflix with the old Prime Video, but Netflix run, runs off AWS. Is there a conflict of interest there? And does it matter? 
there is a content, constant conflict on interest when uh, within the whole platform businesses, you know, uh, we have this discussion uh, also on a regulatory level now, uh, besides financial services uh, with Amazon, for example, that's, uh, you know, accused of um, unfair competition when it's come to pushing their products. Uh, uh, you uh, you have this also with with telecom. You had this discussion with telecom carriers uh, that are allowing uh, were allowing a higher speed of of data for certain ser services that were uh, you know um, participating financially uh, um, in, in those deals. So. Um, obviously, uh, obviously, there, there will be uh, there will be some uh, conflicts and interests, or, or they are already. So, this is something where you know um, I believe in some regulatory aspects. Uh, uh, to be honest, so uh, that, for example, Google, uh, who is servicing uh, Deutsche Bank um, with cloud, will not at a certain point of time say. Okay, I have now services competing with Deutsche Bank, so let's just uh, make their services uh, slower so that the users don't want to need this. Um, I, I, I pretty much believe that we're in a good place to actually regulate it correctly, but the, the general topic of, of, of um, competition and, and platform business, that's something that's, uh, you know, causing a headache with regulators all over the world already. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Michael and Florian, did you want to weigh in that on that at all? No, excellent. Uh, well, oh. no, I think I can just go. You are always tremendous at saying these things. I have to say, I think that you hit a lot of the nails in the head with that one. To be honest, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't have too much more than the comment. Yeah, I agree. We, I, I need to mention the frenemy term um, already earlier in the conversation. Um, I, I think this is this is the vector uh, we're going to see uh, if that that development would would come into play. Excellent, excellent. That's again frenemy. That's the the best description for it. Well, thank you, uh, thank you so much for well, for, first of all, for all of our attendees. Um, little prize, Frida. There we go, Frida. I'll uh, I'll drop you an email and we'll send this in the in the post to you. Um, I don't know where in the world you are, so I'm really hoping that you're, uh, uh, you're 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 not in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But that will be coming coming your way. Um, guys, thank you so much again for taking the time to to join me for this panel. Uh, Florian, where is the best place to find out more about yourself and to strike up any kind of conversation with you? What's your your preferred route? Your preferred method? I, I think LinkedIn is is the best place to to reach me. Just Florian Redeker, and you're gonna find me. Brilliant, excellent, uh, Agnieszka. It's uh, I'm you know I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, but for definitely for the most work related stuff is LinkedIn or obviously Twitter, um, which uh, which I still use, you know. And uh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I always feel LinkedIn is the the conference uh, circuit itself, and Twitter's the bar afterwards. That's kind of the description. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> uh, Michael, where's best to find out more about yourself and uh, Amanda and your best best port of call? Twitter. Yeah, well, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, that's that's more so LinkedIn for myself, but yeah, you can find Absolutely. me there. Excellent, and I'm Ali Patterson everywhere. Guys, thank you so much. This is the first of a series. We're going to be doing a bunch of these, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch you all very soon.